so good to be here with you again at uh, New Day. Um, yeah, Lisa, I really appreciate the fact that you called me family. That means more than you know. Uh, my day job, as Lisa says, is I teach at Denver Seminary, but anybody who knows me knows that I am a professor um, who uh, actually is much more of a pastor. I love local church ministry, and so uh, you all worship on Saturday. I normally worship on Sunday, so this is a huge, great weekend for me. I get to do both, so thank you so much for your hospitality. Uh, yeah, a couple of months ago, I was meeting with Pastor Day, and we were talking about his uh, project and stuff, and uh, Anyway, we got done with that, and then he sent me an email about an hour or two later and said, oh, listen, I'm going to be out of the country on June 8th. Can you come to New Day and preach? And I wrote him back and said, let me pray about it. Yes. So, um, yeah, so good to be with all of you today. What I want to do is take a few minutes this morning, and I want to walk us through the very first section of the Gospel of Mark. So if you brought a Bible or you have your phone or you brought a pad and you want to punch up Mark chapter 1, we're going to just walk our way through the first eight verses of that great gospel. Uh, before we do that, I'm going to ask us to join our hearts together in prayer, and then we'll see what the Lord would uh, teach us through uh, Mark in this particular text. Let's bow together. Father, thanks so much for this day that we gather our hearts together to worship you. And I just want to reiterate the prayer that was prayed a few moments ago. Lord, we are not in control. And I know I like to think that I am, and then you continue to show me that I'm not. And Lord, we need to depend on you. We need to be open to you. And we thank you so much for the love and the mercy and the grace that you show us daily in the Lord Jesus. Lord, we thank you for the church and what it means to all of us, how it encourages us and motivates us and just provides a place of community for us. And Lord, we thank you for your word. And Lord, as we look into this text this morning, I do ask that by the grace that you give us, that you'd enlighten our minds and you might touch our hearts. And Lord, you might just draw us closer to yourself. And we ask all of this in the great and powerful name of Jesus, our Savior. Amen. This is Notre Dame Cathedral in Paris, and as you know, it's one of the most famous buildings in the entire world. Uh, according to the best records we have, the cathedral was started sometime between 1160 and 1163, and it took over 200 years to complete. I think of even greater significance, though, it served for over eight centuries as one of the finest examples of Gothic architecture ever devised and then built. Uh, but as all of you know, on April 15th, this past uh, April, uh, there was a section of the cathedral that caught fire, and it undermined the infrastructure. And then, as you can see from the picture, it caused the beautiful and majestic spire to just crumble down in a heap. Now, when Notre Dame was built, its beauty, its majesty, its ministry made it the wonder of all of Europe and even much of the rest of the world. But now, after catastrophe, it needs to be saved and restored. It needs to be made right. A long, long time ago, there were these two beautiful and marvelous creatures by the names of Adam and Eve. And they lived in this majestic paradise called Eden, where all of their needs were met and they had perfect communion with each other and with God. But then they willfully chose to sin against God and consequently... They too, just like Notre Dame, were ruined. And all of us in this room today, you and me, are their descendants. And therefore, we have 
their poisoned blood running through our veins. And because of that, we are hurt and we are broken and we are only a shadow of what our Heavenly Father originally created us to be. Um, this is Fleming Rutledge. And a couple of years ago, she wrote a book called The Crucifixion, Understanding the Death of Jesus Christ. Uh, I have what I call a theological crush on her. Uh, she is now 84 years old, and it took her 16 years to write this book, but she said she had been thinking about why did Jesus have to die for our sins by crucifixion since she was 12 years old? So in many, many ways, this book is the cumulative work of a lifetime of thought and research and study and prayer. It's a very great book. It's a massive tome. It's very detailed and complex. But essentially what she said was this. The reason that Jesus had to die a horrible, horrible death, naked, alone, crucified before his enemies on a Roman execution wreck, the reason he had to do that was because we are all you and you and me, we're all a lot worse off than we think we are. Well, given that reality, we need to be saved. We need to be restored. We need to be made right. But only something, or perhaps more precisely, Someone really powerful and really loving can accomplish that. Unfortunately, there is such a person. His name is Jesus, and we're told all about him in the Gospel of Mark. Now, most scholars will tell us that Mark was a close associate of the Apostle Peter. And so his Gospel, his biographical account of Jesus' ministry and his teaching and his life and his death and his resurrection... All of these events in Mark's gospel are based on eyewitnesses' account of Peter's experience with the Savior. And one of the very main things that Mark wants to emphasize is that Jesus has come, Jesus came to initiate a wonderful, wonderful, marvelous work of restoration and transformation in you and in me. Look how he starts his gospel off here. Mark 1, verse 1. The beginning of the good news about Jesus, the Messiah, the Son of God. Uh, when I started to study this text that we're looking at this morning a few weeks back, uh, the first two words of this text caught my attention. And rightly so, because Mark intentionally wrote it to do exactly that. Uh, we've got to remember, friends, that he was Jewish, and he wanted to remind his original readers of Genesis chapter 1, verse 1. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And then as you read the rest of Genesis chapter 1, we see that humanity was created in God's image, and the text says that it was all good. But then Genesis 3 tells of the catastrophe that befell Adam and Eve when they sinned. And it points to all the horrible consequences that have plagued humanity ever since. And that's why, friends, Mark's introductory phrase, the beginning, is so important. Uh, things were originally very, very good in the garden, and then they went really, 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 really bad. And now he's announcing that something monumental, something Something wonderful and transformative has happened. In other words, what he's saying is there's the possibility of a new beginning, a fresh start, and then he goes on and he describes it. It's the good news about Jesus, uh, the Messiah, who's the Son of God. Now, Mark's communicating this gospel, this good news, to two main groups who made up his original audience. Uh, the first group were the Jews who had been waiting for centuries for their Messiah. And so this phrase, Jesus the Messiah, the Son of God, uh, it echoed in their minds Psalm 2, 
where the Son there is described, or the Messiah there is described, as both Son and Lord over all of the earth. That was the first group. Uh, the second group, though, that Mark is addressing were all those Gentile Romans who made up the vast majority of the population in the empire in which he lived. And this phrase that Mark uses here, the Son of God, well, that was a shot across the bow of everyone who was loyal to Rome because Rome demanded that they believe in and subscribe to emperor worship. And what Mark's communicating right out of the gate here is he's saying, no, 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 no. There's only, there's only one true God and king, and he's arrived. And his name is not Caesar. His name is Jesus. Friends, this, this is gospel. This is good, good, great news. Because he's the one, in fact, he's the only one who has the heart and the power and the love to transform us and restore us and make us right. Whether we're Jews or Gentiles or men or women or children or white or black or brown or yellow or rich or poor or somewhere in between. It's now possible for us to become what God designed us to be. I don't know how many of you here are uh, familiar with C.S. Lewis. Um, I'm assuming many of you are. Um, let, let me put in a little commercial here, if you don't mind. If you've never read Mere Christianity, if you've never read this book, here's what I want you to do. As soon as church is over today, you get on your phone, you get on your computer, you go to Amazon, you order this book, you have them speed deliver it to you. This is one of the greatest books written in the last 2,000 years, especially the last 100 years. It's just absolutely an amazing, amazing book. Listen to what Lewis says in one section of this book about God's plans for you and you and me. Listen to what he says. He's going to make good his words. If we let him, for we can prevent him if we choose, he will make the feeblest and filthy of us into a god or goddess a dazzling, radiant, immortal creature pulsating all through with such energy and joy and wisdom and love as we cannot now even conceive or imagine. A bright, stainless mirror which reflects back to God perfectly, though, of course, on a smaller scale, his own boundless power and delight and goodness. Now listen, listen, listen. Lewis is right here. The process will be long and in parts very painful, but that's what we're in for, nothing less. He meant what he said. Those who put themselves in his hands will become perfect as he is perfect, perfect in love, wisdom, joy, beauty, and immortality. Wow. What a promise. What a vision. What a else would you want to give your life to? But that raises some questions. How does that process happen? What are some of the steps involved in that happening to you and to me? Uh, what's God's role in that process, and what's our part in that process? Well, those are really great questions. I'm glad you asked them. So um, here in the opening section of his gospel, Mark lays out some initial steps for how God goes about this process of transforming us and what our responsibility in the process is. So we're going to look at these, and the first of these steps comes in verses 2 through 4. And we're told in these verses, in no uncertain terms, that we need to be ready for God's wonderful work of transformation. Let's look at what he says here. It's written in Isaiah the prophet, I'll send my messenger ahead of you who will prepare your way. A voice of one calling in the wilderness, prepare the way for the Lord, make straight paths for him. 
And so John came, baptizing in the desert region and preaching a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. Now, what Mark's doing here is he's reaching back into the Old Testament to two specific sections, one section from the book of Isaiah and another section from the book of 1 Kings. And what he's doing is he's referencing two different prophetic sentences related to the long-awaited rival of the Jewish Messiah. Uh, See, when the Baptist shows up in the Judean wilderness, it had been over 300 years since God had spoken directly to his people in the last book of the Old Testament, the book of Malachi. But what Mark wants us to know here, and this is why it's so important, The Lord's voice is again heard in the appearance and preaching of John the Baptist because he was so similar in style and substance to the prophet Elijah who way back in the 8th century B.C. had also been trying to call God's people back to the Lord. Uh, Friends, Mark relates all this to let us know that the Christian faith is rooted in the promises of the Old Testament. And even more important than that, it's rooted in the faithfulness of our God who always, always, always fulfills his promises. Now, as this text before us shows, the Baptist's role, his purpose, was to prepare people for the Messiah's arrival. I mean, once again, look at verse 2. I will send my messenger ahead of you to prepare your way. Verse 3, a voice of one crying in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord. Listen, listen, listen. God is calling you and me and everybody to embrace a new way of life, the way of Jesus. But we got to be ready for that. A friend of mine writes in one of his books about his grandfather, and he said that when he was in college, he would sometimes go visit his grandfather, who at the time was in a retirement community slash nursing home. And he said his grandfather at this point in his life was in his 90s, and uh, he had been a pastor and an itinerant preacher for much of his life. And he said he would oftentimes come into his grandfather's room, and his grandfather was right on the border of suffering from a little bit of dementia. But every time he came into his grandfather's room, whether it was January or July, his grandfather in the afternoon would be dressed in a three-piece suit, and he would be sitting in a chair, and next to the chair was his bed, and on his bed was his Bible, and my friend said he would come in, and he would talk to his grandfather and say, Grandfather, why are you dressed in your suit, and why do you have your Bible on your bed? And his grandfather said, well, I've got to be ready. I've got to be ready in case somebody comes by, and they want to share a word of Scripture, and they want to join me in a season of prayer. Now, I don't know how that strikes you, I'll be honest. When I read that and talked to my friend about it, it struck me as a little bit strange, maybe a little bit odd. But that's okay because when we come to Mark chapter 1 here and we encounter John the Baptist, we encounter someone who was also strange and odd. I mean, John lived out there in the wilderness by himself. He was clothed in camel hair. He ate bees and their honey. A little bit odd, a little bit strange. And maybe, maybe, maybe the way the Lord works sometimes is that way because he's trying to get our attention. He wants to know. Are we ready? Are we prepared for the wonderful work of transformation that he's called us to, that he wants to do in our lives? 
You know, they say it's wrong to make assumptions, but I'm going to do one here this morning. I'm going to assume since you took time out of your day to come to worship here, and you've leveraged your energy to do that, that you're going to answer, yeah, I'm trying to be ready for that work of transformation that the Lord's going to do in my life. Let me lean into that a little bit and make a couple of suggestions as to how on a regular, consistent, weekly basis, we can make ourselves ready for when God wants to come and do something really, really marvelous, really, really great, really, really transformative. My first suggestion is to encourage you to do what you're all doing right now, and that is come to worship consistently. See, when we gather together in corporate worship, what we're trying to do is make ourselves ready to meet the sovereign God who has the heart and the love and the power to shape us into the men and the women that he has called us to be. Oh, corporate worship is so, so important. Let us never, ever, ever neglect it because it helps prepare us for the great work that God has called us to. Second suggestion. I'm not being critical here. I'm going to be a little bit analytical. It's called cultural diagnosis. You know this and so do I. We live in this amazing, amazing gifted civilization. It's rich. It's affluent. We've got all the conveniences that people in the past couldn't even conceived of. And one of them that dominates our life is this. Now, I'm not being critical. I'm being analytical. Seventy years ago, people could not have conceived of television, computers, or the Internet. You know that, and so do I. But here's the deal. Here's the deal. You and I can't conceive of life without television, computers, and the Internet. The media, let's tell the truth, the media is incredibly powerful in our lives. That's just a fact. That's not going to go away. So here's my suggestion in addition to coming to corporate worship. We have all this marvelous technology, and we want to leverage it, and we want to use it. What we need to do, though, is discipline our use of it. In other words, to hear the sweet, soft voice of Jesus, to prepare ourselves for the work of the Spirit as He wants to come in and do some things to make sure that we're giving proper amounts of time and attention to our soul and our relationship with the Lord, we need to make sure we discipline the amount of time we give to media. I'm not saying don't do it. That's, that's absurd. We're, we need to do that. We're going to do that. I am saying, in addition to coming to church, let's discipline the amount of time we're online, or we're texting, or we're surfing the net, or we're watching TV. Instead, let's make sure, hey, Lord, I'm trying to prepare myself for the work you're trying to do in my life. So, the first step that Mark comes to us and tells us here is, if, if you want to be transformed, if you want to become all that Jesus has made you to be, you've got to be ready for it. You've got to be prepared. But there's a second visible step we can take. And that's to repent. Look what Mark writes here in verses 4 and 5. And so John the Baptist appeared in the wilderness preaching a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. The whole Judean countryside and all the people of Jerusalem went out to him. Confessing their sins, they were baptized by him in the Jordan River. Well, John's ministry was centered in this theme of repentance. And if you continue to read further in Mark's gospel, you see that Jesus likewise centered his ministry of preaching and teaching in the same theme. Now, here's what's really, really interesting about this. Mark says that everyone in and around Jerusalem, in the Judean countryside, went out to John confessing their sins, and then they were baptized as an outward sign of their inward repentance. We don't get this because we live a long, long ways away in terms of time and culture from them. But this was revolutionary because 
public baptism for Jews was completely novel. They would have thought, yeah, you're a Gentile and you confessed your sins and you want to become a God-fearer, you want to come to know Yahweh. Of course, you as a Gentile need to be baptized. But why would God's people, the Jews, need that? Well, the answer to that comes in the meaning of the word repent. Repent literally means to turn around, to go back to the place that we need to be. If we could just put it simply, repentance means an openness, a willingness to change, regardless of whether you're a first century Jew or a 21st century Adventist. Uh, a friend of mine, who actually Pastor Dave knows as well, he just turned 80, and yet he is still incredibly active in ministry, both locally and globally. Well, he was a pastor for almost 35 years, and he once said, and I think he's right about this, he once said that there are a lot of churches that aren't doing very well today because the people who are going to those churches have a lot different expectations of God than what God's going to provide. God will provide grace and help and hope, but only to people who are willing to repent, to those who are willing to change. Now, here's the unfortunate reality. Lots of times people don't want to change. As my friend noted, their resistant mechanisms read like a book. Uh, denial. What? Change? I don't need to change. Everything's fine. Blame. Well, there are some changes that are necessary, but he's the one who needs to change. She's the one who needs to change. They're the ones who need to change. Defensiveness. Well, I don't need to change. That's just your opinion. Victimization. Yes, change is necessary but it's your fault, and I'm going to sue you to get you to change. Friends, Jesus has called us to this marvelous, wonderful, fantastic work of transformation, but the reality is spiritually that cannot happen if we're not willing to admit that we need to be transformed. See, if we genuinely want to be restored and made right and turned into the men and women that God has called us to be, we need not to just be ready, we need to be repentant. An old rabbi used to tell his students, repent the day before you die. And they'd say, but rabbi, we don't know the day of our death. And he'd say, then repent today. Repent today. Friends, I'm a preacher and I like to ask questions, so I'm going to ask you some questions. Is there something in your life today that you need to repent of? You need to be open to being different from. You need to be open to change in this area. Maybe a critical spirit. Maybe a grumbling and complaining attitude. Maybe a stingy approach to money. Or maybe those enemies of our heart, lust and pride, envy. Friends, the Lord wants us to respond enthusiastically, wholeheartedly to the transforming work of Jesus who has come. And we need to demonstrate that enthusiasm by first being ready and secondly by being repentant. There's a third foundational step to this process, and that comes to us in the next few verses. Look at what Mark says here. <clears throat> He's talking about the Baptist. Uh, John wore clothing made of camel's hair with a leather belt around his waist, and he ate locusts and wild honey. And this was his message. After me comes the one more powerful than I, the straps of whose sandals I'm not worthy to stoop down and untie. I baptize you with water, but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. 
let's not lose sight of this. Uh, the Baptist comes and tells his audience, yeah, I want you to repent. I want you to be ready. Uh, but when the Messiah comes, he's going to give you his Holy Spirit. Now, throughout the rest of the New Testament, and if you've read it, you know this, we're told that the Spirit's baptism denotes an internal change of life that's brought about solely by the Lord. Now, I love the way that uh, Eugene Peterson translated these last two verses in his classic work, The Message. Let me just read this to you. Here's how he puts it. As John preached, he said, the real action comes next. The star in this drama, to whom I'm a mere stagehand, he will change your life. I'm baptizing you here in the river, turning your old life in for a kingdom life. His baptism, a holy baptism by the Holy Spirit, will change you from the inside out. The Baptist promises the transforming of God's Spirit to each and every one of us who receive Jesus by faith as Savior and Messiah and Lord. See, we make ourselves ready. We have an attitude of repentance, and then we, we receive. We receive. We receive His grace. I thought this was interesting. I just read this last week that the government of France is 100% committed to rebuilding Notre Dame in all of its former beauty and majesty and glory. But they don't have the money to do it. And so they put out, literally, not just national, but European-wide and even global communiques saying, we would love to receive funds from anyone and everyone who is willing to help us rebuild our beautiful cathedral. See, at a moral and a spiritual level, Fleming Rutledge is right. We're a lot worse off than we think we are. And so what we have to do is recognize we're in the same position as the French government. If we're going to be renewed and transformed and renovated into the people that God's called us to be, we need to receive the help of the Holy Spirit. Friends, we need to be honest about this. And when I was a young Christian, they weren't honest with me about this. I need to be receptive to the Spirit because the way of Jesus is way too hard for me to do it on my own. We need to be receptive to His Spirit because it's only by His grace that we can bear spiritual fruit and participate by His Spirit in the advance of His kingdom. We need to be receptive to His Spirit because He's the one who has the heart. He has the power. He's got the love to transform us. So that raises this question. At least it does for me. What's it look like on a regular basis to be receptive to the Spirit? Well, let me try to illustrate it from my own experience. When I was a little kid, I really, really liked cowboy movies cowboy TV shows. And now that I'm an adult, I really like detective and cop shows. And what I've come to realize over the last couple of years is kind of the same basic narrative drives both old-time cowboy shows and contemporary cop shows. It kind of goes like this. You've got some good guys and you've got some bad guys. And you've got the good guys chasing the bad guys. And then something happens, some kind of event happens, and then the bad guys chase the good guys. But before the end of the hour, before the end of the show, before the end of the movie, the good guys corner the bad guys. And they always tell them the same thing, whether it's old-time cowboy movies or new-time cop movies. Come out with your hands up. See, when you and I come to the Lord in worship corporately or individually, when we come to Him in thanksgiving or prayer, and we come either with our hands up literally or symbolically, what we're saying to the Lord is, Lord, 
I'm surrendering to you. And the reason I'm surrendering to you is because you love me and you've given yourself for me and you're the one who has the power and the ability to give me grace so that I can be transformed. Now, I'm not a mystic. That's just not the way the Lord has ever worked with me. But in the last 15 years, what I've been trying to do at a personal level is listen to the Lord on a more consistent basis. And what I stumbled onto about 15 years ago, and this this is just me, and it's a little bit strange, and I admit that, was I came to realize that when I mow the lawn, and I mow the lawn every week, if before I start up the engine and I put my earplugs in, and I say to the Lord, Lord, your servant is listening. And over the next hour as I mow the lawn, if you want to speak to me, please know I'm receptive to whatever you want to tell me. Now listen, listen, listen. The Lord doesn't talk to me every week when I'm mowing the lawn. That's not going to happen. That's not the way I'm wired. But sometimes, sometimes he does. I had an episode last September where it was very, very clear to me before I finished mowing the lawn the Lord said, call those two people. Send that email. Call that friend. And as I did each of those, it was really, really, really clear. The Lord had communicated. Friends, you know this and so do I. Jesus is the Messiah. He's the Son of God. As Mark has laid out here in Mark chapter 1, these first eight verses. And he wants to do this amazing, marvelous, fantastic, awesome work of transformation in you and me. And he's the only one who can do that. Because he's got the power, he's got the ability, he's got the heart, and he's got the love, the love, the love to make that happen. Your role, my role in that process is to make ourselves ready, have an attitude of repentance, and then make sure our hearts are receptive to his work. This is Rosaria Butterfield. Um, Some of you may know this. She's a pastor's wife who lives in Durham, North Carolina, with her husband, Kent. And she lives with her kids, obviously, who she homeschools. She's also a speaker, and she's an incredibly gifted writer. And we'd look at that and go, well, yay, good, good for you, Rosario. Nothing too abnormal about that. <clears throat> what some of you, or perhaps most of you, don't know is that back in the early 1990s, Rosaria Butterfield was a tenured professor of English literature and women's studies at Syracuse University. She was a very pro actively, sexually active lesbian. And she was one of the founders nationally of the LGBTQ movement. But 20 years ago, in 1999, after a more than two-year study of the Scripture, in the company of some Christian neighbors who just loved her, accepted her, did the best they could to answer her questions. She gave her life to Jesus in a rather dramatic fashion. Hers is a wonderful story of marvelous transformation that God can do in absolutely anybody's life if they'll simply respond to Jesus and his grace. And the thing I love about Rosaria Butterfield is she knows that this is an ongoing, lifelong process that never stops. As she says here on her website, as the years unfolded after my conversion, I started to look dangerously cleaned up. I'm not. Friends, none of us have arrived. And God knows that. So whether you're here today and for some reason or another, you're just kind of still investigating this whole Christian thing, or you're relatively new to the faith, or you've been walking with Jesus for decades, we 
he's still calling every single one of us to his exciting and marvelous and fantastic and ongoing, never-ending work of transformation. He's calling us, you and me, to enthusiastically respond to that by this week making sure that we are ready, we are repentant, and we are really, really, really receptive. I'm going to pray for us, and then our great worship team here at New Day is going to come back up and lead us in some singing. Let's bow together. Father, thanks again for the fact you never give up on us. You will hold us in our hands. And you are committed to keeping us safe and getting us into the kingdom of God, whatever it takes. We love you. We praise you. And now help us to worship you once again with all of our hearts. And we ask this in your name and for our sake. Amen.